Sunday with Barbara Walters, Diane Sawyer, Sam Donaldson, Connie Chubb, Charles Gibson, and Hugh Downs. Tonight, who killed John Benet Ramsey? I did not have anything to do with it. I did not kill my daughter, John Benet. The grand jury is hearing the evidence in secret. But now, we reveal startling new evidence that our sources say police found. A child's scream on the fateful night. A surprising voice on the 911 call. Something mysterious about the ransom note. Are these clues that could help unmask a killer? You look at something and you figure out who wrote it, in essence. Yes, that's what I do best. And for the first time on television, an exclusive interview with the lead detective who just quit the case. Do the police know who killed John Benet Ramsey? Elizabeth Vargas with provocative details you've never heard before. What happened to John Benet Ramsey? The perfect murder? Plus, you think you're giving money to a well-established charity. There's no reason for me to be suspicious. But what if we told you that dozens of familiar-sounding charities are the creation of just one man? What you're saying is that the old established charity, right. they own everything. There's no competition allowed. Critics say he's raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, and a lot of people say they've been fooled. How do people get away with this? I mean, how do they do this? Did you assume you were speaking to one of the, the big cancer charities? Absolutely. Where did your donation go? Arnold Diaz investigates charities that play the name game. Those stories, plus the latest on Hurricane George tonight, Sunday, September 27th, 1998, after this brief message. The list of automotive awards received by Nissan this year is now even longer. J.D. Power & Associates ranked the Nissan Frontier, best compact pickup in initial quality. And once again, IntelliChoice labeled both Nissan Quest and Nissan Sentra a best overall value in their class. And right now, you can get an amazing $2,000 cash back on any new 98 Nissan during our award-winning clearance event. The 99s are coming, so hurry. Award-winning vehicles like these won't sit around for long. When I heard about it, migraine headache pain relief without a prescription, clinically proven from Excedrin, I didn't believe it. I mean, how can you if you know what migraine pain is like? But I tried it because you'll try anything to get rid of migraines. And you know what? Excedrin migraine relieves migraine pain. My own research. That I believe. Excedrin migraine, the only non-prescription medicine approved for migraine pain relief. Hey there, when you hear KFC, what pops into your mind? All right, best bucket of fried chicken in the world, but try again, KFC. I'm Hood, you got bucket on the brain. Looky here, I also make something new called popcorn chicken. Crunchy morsels of tender white meat, it's mouth popping good. Try it for $1.99. See, I make a whole lot more than fried chicken in a bucket, because I am a chicken genius. At KFC, we do chicken right, and not just in a bucket, neither. From ABC News in New York, Barbara Walters and Diane Sawyer. Good evening and welcome to 2020 Sunday. Let us say at the outset that we've all seen a lot of stories about the John Bonet Ramsey case, but tonight we have new details, new information. Isn't it amazing, Diane, that it's been two years and we are still fascinated by this case? And two years in which no charges have been brought, no indictment has been brought. And we can't emphasize enough that the Ramseys are presumed innocent under the law and evidence is still being gathered. But tonight we have provocative new information that sources tell us comes from the police investigation. We also have the first interview ever with one of the lead detectives who served on the case from the beginning and who recently resigned in protest, and you'll find out why. A grand jury in Colorado was just beginning to review the murder evidence in secret now. But tonight, Elizabeth Vargas has the John Benet Ramsey story with brand new revelations. Frantic family members began searching the Ramsey home. They found John Benet's body inside a rarely used room in the basement. She had been strangled. Duct tape covered her mouth. It is clearly a new chapter in the case of John Benet, a bright blonde six-year-old the world knows best through the distorting lens of the beauty pageant cameras. 
and the spotlight of a bizarre crime scene. Around 9 p.m. on Christmas Day, 1996, the Ramsey say they came home from dinner with friends and carried a sleeping John Bonet upstairs to bed. They say it was the last time they saw her alive. One year, eight months, and 21 days after the murder of John Bonet Ramsey, grand jurors assembled here in Boulder to begin reviewing evidence in the case. Sources say much of it implicates her parents. The proceedings here are secret, and unlike witnesses in federal grand juries, witnesses here can't even reveal they testified. Now, we don't know exactly what the district attorney is presenting to those grand jurors, but sources have told us some of the key evidence Boulder police have collected. Last June 1st and 2nd, Boulder detectives made a presentation to the district attorney. That presentation included evidence, sources say, suggesting that one or both of the Ramseys were involved in or had guilty knowledge of the crime. We also discussed and identified and articulated 30 specific reasons that we believe a grand jury is necessary in this case and why we think it will be helpful in moving us forward. Our information on what was said in that meeting comes from well-placed sources in various law enforcement agencies. We emphasize there may be evidence to the contrary not available to us or different conclusions may be drawn. And a reminder, in law and in fairness, all people are considered innocent until proven guilty. Sources say the ransom note written by the alleged kidnapper is considered a key piece of evidence. Handwriting experts have ruled out John Ramsey and others close to the family. They have not excluded Patsy Ramsey, who has submitted several samples. The ransom note analysis, however, doesn't end with handwriting. The detectives enlisted the help of this man, Professor Donald Foster of Vassar College. You look at something and you figure out who wrote it, in essence. Yes, that's what I do best. Foster analyzes not the handwriting, but the text, the content, and syntax. Use of language, grammar, source material, borrowings, political or religious opinions, and uh, anything that might enter into making a, a piece of writing distinctively one person's or another's, from uh, punctuation to spelling and so on. The professor once discovered Shakespeare was the author of a centuries-old manuscript, and the FBI hired him to prove Ted Kaczynski wrote the Unabomber Manifesto. But he is perhaps best known for proving um, Anonymous was really Newsweek's Joe Klein. Early in the case, Foster actually volunteered his expertise to Patsy Ramsey after reading of her extreme distress. Ironically, she never called, but the Boulder District Attorney's Office did. In the Ramsey case, Foster had high marks for the detectives who brought him an impressive sampling of Patsy Ramsey's writings letters, notes, even files police retrieved from the family computer. My experience with the uh, Boulder detectives was that they were entirely professional in their work, that they were dedicated to the case. Have you determined who wrote the ransom note? I have no comment. Foster is bound by a confidentiality agreement with the Boulder Police Department, but sources tell us in his report, summarized by detectives in the June presentation of evidence, Foster identified the writer of the ransom note as Patsy Ramsey. Foster analyzed commonly used words and also found similarities between Patsy's letter format and that of the ransom note writers. The indentations and punctuation, especially the repeated use of the exclamation point. We looked back through our own archives and found two samples of Patsy's writing. This 1996 Christmas letter peppered with exclamation points and this 1978 photo with a two-line note, each sentence ending in an exclamation point. Also, sources say as many as 250 books were cataloged and photographed from various rooms in the Ramsey house in the event they yielded possible clues. At least one book found in the bedroom did. Mindhunter by FBI profiler John Douglas. In Chapter 16, there is a case of a young girl who was kidnapped sexually assaulted and suffocated with duct tape. When the killer called the mother, he began with the words, listen carefully. The same two words begin the ransom note. 
Patsy Ramsey has said she found the note at the bottom of the back spiral staircase. She has said she read it and then called for John. In an interview for A&E airing tomorrow night, John Ramsey recalled his reaction after he read the note. That was the worst moment. It was suddenly realizing that someone had your daughter, your child, and has taken her, and she was gone, and we didn't know where she was, and it was dark, it was cold outside. But there's something curious here. According to a source, there are no fingerprints on the ransom note. Not Patsy Ramsey's, nor John Ramsey's. The question is, if the Ramsey's held the note to read it, where are their prints? Experts were hired to enhance the 911 call placed by Patsy Ramsey at 5.52 a.m. the morning of the crime. Sources report the enhancement appears to reveal the voice of nine-year-old Burke, the Ramsey's son, asking his parents, what did you find? In that June presentation, the suggestion was the Ramseys were not being truthful when they told the police that Burke was asleep until after the police arrived. But what was Patsy wearing? According to our sources, when Patsy Ramsey greeted the police that morning, she had on makeup and the same black pants, fur trim boots, and red sweater she wore with a black and red checked blazer to Fleet White's home for dinner the night before. Sources say the police theory presented in June was that Patsy Ramsey never went to bed that night. According to sources, a forensic pathologist concluded John Bonet was first hit on the head with a blunt object, consistent with the shape of the head of a flashlight, and she was immediately knocked out. After that, they say she was strangled to death with a nylon cord, then wrapped in a blanket and hidden in the dark with a favorite Barbie nightgown nearby. Why not just dispose of the body? In their June presentation, detectives cited FBI profilers who believe it is more difficult for parents than intruders to callously dispose of a body. Sources say a neighbor who slept with her window cracked two inches told police she heard a scream between midnight and 1 a.m. The neighbor said it was, quote, obviously that of a child. The question raised, if the neighbor heard the scream, why didn't the Ramseys? I'm appalled that anyone would think that John or I would be involved in such a hideous, heinous crime. But let me assure you that I did not kill Jean Benet. I did not have anything to do with it. I love that child with my whole of my heart and soul. I did not kill my daughter, John Bonet. A $100,000 reward offered by the Ramseys for information about the killer was also discussed in the June presentation of evidence by Boulder police to the DA's office. Please, please, if you know anything, I beg you to call us. Call us. Police find it significant the $100,000 reward has never been collected. From the beginning, the Ramseys and their attorneys have suggested that an intruder could have entered through this basement window, which had been broken. Sources say that detectives in the June presentation excluded this as a point of entry. They say the grate above was covered with spider webs that were undisturbed, showing it had not been removed for access. One problem, two detectives reported seeing the webs, but no one ever photographed them. Sources tell us many of the items used by the killer came from the house, the notepad in one room, from the kitchen, a Sharpie pen with ink consistent with ink on the note. The wooden paintbrush which held the nylon cord around John Bonet's neck was from Patsy's art supply set kept here, outside the windowless room in the basement where John Bonet's body was found. A forensic pathology expert concluded a sliver consistent with that paintbrush was found in John Bonet's genital area, indicating she was sexually assaulted with that paintbrush. 
The origin of the black duct tape and nylon cord used on John Bonet has not been confirmed, nor has the source of a partial marking from a high tech boot found near the body. Sources say detectives told the district attorney they believe the timing of the events discounts an intruder theory. Sources say detectives prepared a time study showing how long it would take an intruder to enter, collect items around the house, write a practice ransom note, and then a final draft, accost, assault, and murder John Bonet, stage the scene, and then leave the house, all without disturbing the family. Sources say the June presentation also included an analysis of the Ramsey's behavior, the lack of cooperation with police, and the fact that they hired separate lawyers. Also noted was the point that the Ramseys had both access and opportunity to commit the crime. Finally, sources say the last point made in the June presentation was that four fibers, consistent with those from Patsy Ramsey's black and red check blazer, were found in a strategic location on the sticky side of the duct tape which John Ramsey pulled from John Bonet's mouth. He left the tape in the basement, an area Patsy Ramsey said she had not been during the time in question. So how strong is this evidence as reportedly presented to the district attorney last June? We asked noted former prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi to serve as our ABC News consultant on the case and to review the information we gathered. Again, we point out there may be other evidence we are not aware of gathered by the detectives or the DA. The strongest evidence against the Ramseys in this case, as I see it, is nothing that directly implicates them, but the implausibility that anyone else committed these murders. But paradoxically, Paradoxically, the strongest evidence that I've just pointed to, by its very nature, is the weakest evidence against the Ramses. Why? Because even if we come to the conclusion that John Bonet was not murdered by an intruder, the inevitable question presents itself which one did it? And a prosecutor can't argue to a jury, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is very clear here that either Mr. or Mrs. Ramsey committed this murder and the other one covered up. Even if the DA could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that John Bonet had to have been murdered by at least one of her parents, there'd be no case to take to the jury unless they could prove beyond a reasonable doubt which one did it. Why couldn't it have been Burke Ramsey, Patsy and John's son? He was the third person in the house that well, night. Well, it certainly could have been. But if it were, the, certainly the parents would know about it. And the question is, why wouldn't they release that information? It's not like they're protecting him from a life in prison. He's nine years old, and in Colorado, he could not be punished at all. There'd be no, no legal consequences. The only thing is he'd get medical help that he obviously would need. Let's go through some of the evidence that we have been told was presented in this okay. June meeting. First of all, the ransom note. How much weight does that carry in a court of law? Well, it, it, it carries weight, obviously, but it's not conclusive. Don't get me wrong, it's good evidence. It's not conclusive evidence. It's not going to carry the day. Even if it did carry the day, and you could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Patsy Ramsey wrote that ransom note, that doesn't mean that she committed the murder. You have characterized this case as a non-physical circumstantial evidence case. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, physical circumstantial evidence, e.g., fingerprints, blood, bullet, hair matchups, usually is the very strongest type of evidence in a criminal case. But non-physical circumstantial evidence cases, as the Ramsey case, uh, almost always are the, the, the toughest to solve, the most difficult to get a conviction of. Because we're talking about things like um, uh, an inappropriate remark. Hiring separate lawyers. Yeah, a not subtle giving... effort to deflect the investigation. So th this is a very tough case. The only physical evidence that I know of so far are, th are these four fibers that supposedly came from Patsy Ramsey's uh, clothing. And there could easily have been a transference from her clothing to John Bonet's clothing that would have been normal, expected. So given what sources have told us was presented, mm -hmm. at, and given what sources have told us is the evidence against mm -hmm. the Ramseys, if this were, case were to go to court, you think the Ramseys would beat it? I think they would, yeah, at this particular level. At this particular level, yeah. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you 
that the prosecutor has to prepare that summation for hundreds of hours. I'm talking about two, three, four hundred hours of preparation so he can put each speck of evidence upon another speck for the jury until ultimately there's a strong, irresistible mosaic of guilt. The prosecutor's argument and, and, and logic has got to be so powerful that the jury feels it has no choice but to convict. On Friday, we spoke to lawyers for John and Patsy Ramsey, and they told us that they believe the Ramseys are the innocent victims of a, quote, unprecedented and vicious media assault attempting to influence the grand jury. They also believe police have stirred up, in their words, a lynch mob. The lawyers say it's difficult to address specifics without seeing the actual police reports, and they added that they've not heard the 911 enhancement. Furthermore, the lawyers also challenged the credibility of Donald Foster, who analyzed the text of the ransom note. And they told us they believe it's easier to hear a scream in the basement from across the street than from the Ramsey's third floor master bedroom. The murder of Jean Benet Ramsey consumed his life. So why did this detective suddenly up and quit the case and his job? He'll tell you tonight in an Elizabeth Vargas exclusive when 2020 Sunday continues. When your allergies are a nightmare, you need help. Not just any help. You need the power of Zyrtec. Prescription Zyrtec starts working fast and keeps on working for 24 hours. And Zyrtec works against so many allergies, from cats and dogs to pollen and dust. So when allergies are a nightmare, and when are they not, remember the power of Zyrtec. In studies, drowsiness was the most common side effect. Others included fatigue and dry mouth. Most side effects were mild or moderate. Most people weren't bothered by them enough to stop taking Zyrtec. To learn more, look for an ad in Life magazine or ask your doctor or pharmacist. For 97 years, GMC has designed trucks for people who drove them not because they were trendy, but because their lives depended on them. Heroes who measured a truck by its power and its determination. That heritage lives in the new Yukon Denali. A luxury SUV with a 255 horsepower V8. It meets the demands of professionals and the standards of history. The Yukon Denali by GMC. Looking out on the morning rain. Maybe it's time for a hair color that's actually good for your hair. Natural Instincts from Clairol has aloe, chamomile, and ginseng. Natural Instincts gives you rich, natural-looking color, and your hair is better conditioned than before you colored it. <gasps> Claire All Natural Instincts, now with aloe replenishing conditioner. My goodness, stocks, bonds, equities, large... Ooh, 10 best bets. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Peter Lynch? Can I help you out? Whew, talk about information overload. It's too much. But you must know all this. You don't need all this. It's my mission to be informed. Fidelity can help you work out what you should know. <laughs> For your free investing guide, call 1-800-FIDELITY or visit fidelity.com. You're going to buy something? <laughs> just browsing. Mike's romance with Heidi Klum heats up as he shares his international knowledge. I just know the, uh, the German word for uh, constipation, which I believe is far from pooping. <laughs> then the runaway hit, Sports Night. You're smiling and holding a ratings book both at the same time. What do we know? We know we got a homer in our first at-bat. Sports Night after Spin City, ABC Tuesday. Oprah Winfrey presents David and Lisa. David is paralyzed by his anxiety and suspicion. Yeah, I won't let anyone near me. Lisa struggles to escape her private world. But with the help of one man... Don't give up on him. ...they take a risk and learn to live again. Sidney Poitier stars in David and Lisa, ABC November. The big question most people seem to ask is, why, after nearly two years, has no one been arrested for the murder of John Benet Ramsey? Well, the insider you're about to meet is a very strong opinion. He is Steve Thomas, and he was one of the lead detectives in the Ramsey investigation, and then suddenly, last month, he quit, igniting a firestorm of controversy. 
Tonight, for the first time, he speaks out. And while his ground rule was that he wouldn't discuss the evidence, he does tell Elizabeth Vargas and the rest of us why he thinks this murder remains unsolved. This case took over your life. Well, it absolutely did. It became all-consuming, night and day, the birthdays and holidays, and Christmas and anniversaries that we spent uh, away from home. Detective Steve Thomas is a dedicated cop with a solid record for 13 years. For nearly two years, he says he and other detectives worked 100-hour weeks, all in the name of justice for a murdered six-year-old. That's some of the sentiment behind where, where the detectives stand and what they feel uh, about John Monet. And yet, on August 6th, you resigned from your job. A career that uh, I loved, a career uh, that I think I was pretty good at. But on that painful day he resigned, on John Benet's birthday, Detective Thomas sent flowers to her grave, turned in his badge, and wrote a scathing letter. In your letter, you made a very serious allegation accusing the district attorney, Alex Hunter, of thoroughly compromising the Ramsey investigation. I stand by my letter. That letter, a five-page, single-spaced hand grenade thrown right into a case that seemed to have stalled for months. In it, Thomas accused the Boulder District Attorney's Office of mishandling and compromising the case. He accused them of shameless tactics against innocent people, of failing to support basic search warrants for telephone and credit card records, and of sharing police evidence with the Ramseys and their lawyers. It just got to a point where it was very disheartening. Also in Thomas's letter, the serious accusation that some evidence was never collected, some never tested, because of the office of Boulder's district attorney, Alex Hunter. If I come across as arrogant, I apologize to you for that. Citing the sensitivity surrounding the grand jury, Hunter declined our request for an interview. Some people might say, well, you are the police. It doesn't matter what support or lack thereof you're getting from the DA's office. Just go out and get the evidence and tell us who the killer is. Why can't you do that? maybe on television, but police detectives know uh, that that is not the case in real life. Do the police know who killed John Benet Ramsey? I'm not going to answer that question. He says he is loyal to his victim above all else, and since his resignation, many have called him a hero who forced a reluctant prosecutor to convene a grand jury. Some call him a traitor. There have been some critics who maintain that your letter may actually hurt um, a prosecution's case in the future, that in fact it may be used in a trial to help a defendant get off. I hate to think that the truth would hurt anything. You called this case a failure of the system. Those are very harsh words. And we're coming up on the second anniversary of this homicide. Uh, I certainly don't see a success or a victory of justice. Did John Benet get to you more than other cases? Absolutely. Someone uh, needs to stand up and speak for John Benet. Um, she can't speak for herself, and the detectives tried to do that. We're going to solve this case, but we're going to do it our way. As Boulder's district attorney for 26 years, running the last seven terms unopposed, Alex Hunter is certainly popular. Yet the Steve Thomas letter ignited a firestorm of criticism. We asked him to remove the case from Alex Hunter's jurisdiction. In a point, Some key in a point Ramsey in case Thomas witnesses joined Thomas in a call for a special prosecutor, like Fleet White and his wife Priscilla, who had dinner with the Ramseys that Christmas day. It is likely that the district attorney has attempted to discourage police detectives. Last month, a front page column called Alex Hunter the reluctant prosecutor. Veteran reporter Juliet Whitman outlined a sampling of cases not filed or undercharged. I think there's real fear and incompetence and laziness. 
Attorney Claudia Bailiff ran Boulder's Rape Crisis Center for five years. She says she was so surprised at the plea bargains for child molesters. In 1990, she prepared this formal study of Hunter's record. The most staggering statistic we came up with was of 60 individuals who were convicted of sexually abusing children or incest, only one went to prison. And we were absolutely stunned by that. Bailiff resigned in frustration. The new team at the Rape Crisis Center says Hunter's record has improved. But what about the thorny case of Sid Wells, murdered in 1983? June Menger is Sid Wells' mother. It's like deja vu for me watching the Ramsey case. Before John Bonet, the world media swarmed on Boulder to cover the murder case of Sid Wells, the steady boyfriend of Shauna Redford, Robert Redford's daughter. Wells, a handsome journalism student, was fatally shot in his apartment in the back of the head with a 20-gauge shotgun. Fred okay, Neitzel was the lead open. detective on the Did case. He arrested Sid Wells' roommate, Thane Smyka. How convinced were you? that Thane Smyka was the killer? I was very convinced myself. 100% sure? My opinion was 100%. Back then, cops found Thane Smyka with a 20-gauge shotgun and two rare shells with pellets the FBI said chemically matched the ones found in the victim's head. But Hunter's office thought the case was weak and Smyka was out of jail in less than a month. But there was something else that made the detectives angry. This document, Neitzel says he found it by accident. It shows a puzzling deal Hunter cut with a suspected murderer. If Smyka would waive his right to a speedy trial, Hunter would guarantee a grand jury would not indict him. At first it was total shock, then it became rage. The deal did allow for a future prosecution, and now, under the scrutiny of the Ramsey case, the Smyka case has been reopened. State-of-the-art ballistics tests confirm the old ones. But here's the problem. Thane Smyka skipped town and disappeared more than a decade ago. Again, June Menger, the murder victim's mother, on Alex Hunter. I think he should resign. But the pressing question today is, can District Attorney Alex Hunter rise to the current challenge of the Ramsey case? Again, ABC News consultant Vincent Bugliosi. I'm sure he's an honorable uh, person and he's interested in seeking justice in this case, but uh, he's certainly not the stereotypical DA who's tough and hard-nosed and you need an aggressive DA in a situation like this. And he apparently is not that type of person. Which perhaps is why his critics say it took public protest to get the Ramsey case to a grand jury after nearly two years. Remember, a grand jury can compel reluctant witnesses to testify. How unusual is it to wait that long to impanel a grand well, jury to it's, investigate it's, it's that? It's highly unusual, particularly when you have two suspects and they're not cooperating with you. I mean, it's DA 101, that when you have two suspects, you do everything possible immediately to separate those two and not give them time for their stories to harden and to reconcile with each other. It's being done now, a year and a half later, but it's a little late in the day. Incompetence. Incompetence. Incompetence, right. Based on what we know right now, based on what our sources have told us is the evidence right now. Right. If they don't come up with anything more, is this the perfect murder? Obviously, if they don't come up with enough evidence, then the perpetrators committed a perfect murder, yeah. And now one more note in the case. This weekend, a detective who came out of retirement to help the district attorney try to solve the case resigned, saying he believes an intruder committed the crime. As for Steve Thomas, he now works as a carpenter. And the grand jury? It has been at work for four days, hearing testimony from the first police officers to arrive at the crime scene. This man knows the rewards of giving, and maybe you've given to one of his 200 charities and not even known it. How do people get away with this? I mean, how do they do this? Have you been fooled by the name game?